The Battle of Jutland was joined on May the 31st, 1916. A clash in which two fleets of the most lethal battleships the world had ever seen met in devastating combat. The British fleet was bigger and had more firepower. Yet in the heart of the battle, four of its finest warships were destroyed by devastating explosions, leaving the outcome of the battle on a knife edge. It led a British commander in the heart of the fighting to utter the words, there seems to be something wrong with our bloody ships today. But what was it? The final evidence of what went wrong still lies beneath the waves of the North Sea at Jutland, where the proud remains of a historic battle now rest. Theories abound as to why these ships sank. Bad tactics, lack of armor, overstocking of explosives, and sheer bad luck have all been blamed. Now, an expedition on these wrecks promises to explain what went wrong with these bloody ships and how this great battle came to hang in the balance. It's August 2003. An international team of divers are hard at work looking for forensic evidence at the bottom of the North Sea. Evidence as to why, in 1916, a series of British warships blew up with catastrophic loss of life and huge political consequences. Marine architect Bill Jurens is determined to know what was wrong. He's working with deep sea diver Innis McCartney to find out. We've got uh, accurate GPS positions. We should very quickly be able to discern which parts of the wreck are largely in one piece. They've already dived one wreck on this expedition and found evidence that confirms the ships were carrying far more explosives than they were designed to. More than that, these particular vessels were not ideally suited to the head-to-head -head fight that they encountered. Battle cruiser was designed to have guns that were big enough to sink anything it could catch and to be fast enough to run away from anything it couldn't sink. If you saw something big coming over the horizon, like a battleship, then it was time to get out of there. At least that was the theory. But in the first phase of the battle, an advanced party of British battle cruisers under Vice Admiral Beatty had stood and engaged the enemy, and they'd taken a pounding from the Germans. Beatty had lost two of his ships to catastrophic explosions, but had turned and was now running north with Admiral Scheer's mass German high seas fleet chasing him. Over the horizon, dead ahead, lurked Admiral Jellicoe and the entire British Grand Fleet. If Beatty could draw the Germans onto Jellicoe's guns, he would have set up the greatest ambush in naval history. But more British warships would fall prey to mysterious internal explosions before the day was over. The dive boat is now making good steam to the north, to the site of defense, their next wreck. If ever there was a ship in the wrong place at the wrong time, the defense was it. It happened at about 6 p.m. as the two battle fleets were about to meet head on. Admiral Beatty was now running his squadron north as fast as he could go, and Shear's fleets were giving chase. He felt that there might be elements of the Grand Fleet, even more for him to gobble up and destroy. It was the only way the Germans were ever going to beat the Grand Fleet, was to destroy a substantial part of it in detail. And that's what he was trying to do. What the Germans didn't know was that they were about to run into Admiral Jellicoe's entire British Grand Fleet. It was time for Jellicoe to prepare to engage. The cruising formation of the Grand Fleet was six columns of four battleships each. This was for compactness, it was for anti-submarine security, but the battle line was a long line, six miles long, of 24 dreadnoughts. So the fleet had to get from this compact cruising formation into one long line. The moment where you find Admiral Sir John Jellicoe taking the decision 
as to how he is going to deploy the Grand Fleet can actually be seen as one of the key dramatic moments of the whole of the First World War. The pressure on him must have been immense, and it's quite true what Churchill was said, that he was the only man capable of losing the war in an afternoon. Jellicoe had to guess which way to deploy his ships, getting them from cruising formation traveling south into fighting formation running west to east. But during that complicated maneuver, his 100 ships would be temporarily defenseless. If the Germans arrived before the ambush was set and caught Jellicoe mid-maneuver, they would cut his vulnerable British fleet to ribbons. In the North Sea, a team of explorers are on the hunt for evidence as to why, in the Battle of Jutland in 1916, so many British ships should fall prey to mystery internal explosions. In the first phase of the battle, the British advance fleet under Vice Admiral Beatty had lost two battle cruisers to catastrophic detonations. But now the Germans were chasing him north, unaware that Admiral Jellicoe's massed guns of the main British Grand Fleet were preparing an ambush. But until Jellicoe's battle line was in position, the British were desperately vulnerable. When Jellicoe deployed, the scene was one of absolute chaos. The Grand Fleet was in six columns deploying into one. That was a complicated manoeuvre. There's no two ways about it. Add to that, Beatty's battlecruiser fleet were also coming from the opposite direction almost, cutting across, and the battlecruisers had to get to the front of the line. That caused chaos. The ships were corkscrewing round, turning, falling into line, trying to avoid each other. The engines were going at full pelt for the most part. Different sized ships going at different speed, massively different turning circles, all whizzing round in this small area. This was Jellicoe's moment of death or glory. If the Germans could attack before he completed his move, he was finished. But the risk was more than worth taking. The master stroke that Jellicoe was trying to achieve is called crossing the enemy's T. This works for one simple reason. Battleships work best when firing broadside, as all the guns can work at the same time. A fleet is least effective when all the battleships are head on. The ideal position is with your ships ranged across from left to right, with your enemy's ships below you ranged top to bottom. Jellicoe gets it spot on and absolutely right, and he finds himself in the supreme position, exactly where he wanted to be. Shear suddenly realises that here he is in exactly the position that he spent the whole time since he assumed command trying to avoid. The Germans were about to have their tea well and truly crossed. And yet in the midst of this resolving chaos, one British admiral was about to engage the enemy with catastrophic consequences for yet another ship. In between the fleets, there was one small cruiser squadron. This was led by Admiral Arbuthnot, an admiral of character, as they used to say. He would do what he thought was right in battle and bugger the consequences. He seems to have only had eyes for the destruction of the Wiesbaden. Instead of clearing the line, he got between the fleets, he found himself totally isolated, and there he was when the German battlecruisers came out of the mists, sighted him and opened up on him. In a few seconds, it was all over. The cruiser was not very far away from us. She had four funnels and two masts. Lieutenant Commander Hauser shouted, may I fire? Yes, fire away. Then, just as we were about to fire, something terrific happened. The English ship broke in half with a tremendous explosion. Black smoke and debris shot in the air, and then she sank before our eyes. Admiral Arbuthnot had blundered, and his crew of 903 men all paid with their lives. Eyewitness accounts tell of a huge explosion that ripped the ship into pieces. If it is a mass of scattered debris as reported, it would be of little use to the dive team. But Innes has been here before and remembers a significant structure. With all the sophisticated equipment on board, the potential that an intact wreck could provide is huge. Time to drop the ROV and take a look. 
So down there, we should see magazine though. Yeah. Here's the lower part of the barbette. So. Oh, this is, look at that. Yeah, that's that, really in nice condition. Yeah, yeah. Some of control. Yeah. What's this in here? Yeah. That's all shells. Projectiles, yeah. yeah. There you go. I think we can do a really good map of this tomorrow. With the size of the wreck, I think we'll get a really good map mm -hmm. out of it. And the visibility. Mm -hmm. The results are encouraging. The ROV reveals a wreck sitting on the ocean floor, and a large part of it seems to be intact. Hatches have their covers blown open, but huge areas of the ship are unmolested, contrary to witness reports. It appears to be almost in one piece. Here at last is first-hand evidence for Bill and the team to investigate. In the stunningly clear water, the ROV gives Bill a window on the seabed some 150 feet below. That's ready-use ammunition, likely. Now, the, you see, you can see the ready-use ammunition there is, is just laying in, in the corners where it should be. The hatch is open, people got out. Yeah, it looks like it. Sure did. <laughs> Maybe. Well, it wouldn't be open in action. No, that's true. So, yeah, I mean, it'd be locked off from the inside as well, Yeah, it? well, yeah, somebody, somebody got out through there. Hmm. They may have escaped this death trap, but all perished in the final explosion. The wreck of the defense is a time capsule for Bill. In this case, an open turret door points not to one instant detonation, but to a burning explosion of flash flame that swept through parts of the ship. The door that uh, was open in the turret would seem to indicate that uh, people had time to get out. That indicates probably that there wasn't a big flash or flame through that particular area. Normally, a door like that would be clipped shut in action, as you might expect. This is proof. If men had time to even attempt escape, it wasn't a direct hit on the magazine. That would have meant an instant explosion. This supports the theory that cordite mismanagement was also responsible for the blast. It's more likely now that part of the ship was hit and fire traveled along the ammunition handling passageways, eventually detonating the magazines. If this were the case, the flash-proof doors would be open. That's the evidence the divers will be looking for in the morning. As a wreck, this is probably one of the most intact ones we've seen so far. It's time to brief the divers, and Bill makes sure everyone knows what they're looking for. If we can look out for open doors in the ammunition passages if they happen to be visible from the outsides of the ship, because that would be the smoking gun. If the doors in the ammunition passages are closed, that's an indicator that they didn't pass flash. If they're open or they're buckled, then that would indicate that they may have passed flash. So if we can possibly view those without penetrating the wreck, that's what we'd like to do. Okay. Uh, the explosion, as so described by witnesses who watched the fence sink, was supposed to have been so massive that very little of the rest of the ship was expected to be found. Now, clearly, since we've been here yesterday and today, we have seen an enormous ship that is largely in one piece. In accordance with Ministry of Defence instructions, no one is allowed to enter the wreck. The divers will need luck on their side if they're to find the kind of proof Bill's looking for. Finding the huge propeller confirms they're in the right area. If the divers can find these open passageway doors, it'll point to a procedural failure rather than a design failure. If these doors weren't blown open, could they have been left open? Another set of clues is also emerging. The roofs of the turrets are blown off like hats, but some more violently than others. This suggests a blast traveling along the connecting ammunition passageways and venting up through the turrets as it went. Frustratingly, the gashes in the wreck have failed to reveal any corridor doors, open or closed. But then, the divers get the luck they were hoping for. An exposed ammunition hoist, ruptured or blown open. 
This is the remains of the system that passed the cordite from the handling room below up to the turrets above. Did it also pass flash fire down into the bowels of the ship and onto the magazine? The cameras record the damage patterns. With the data on tape, it's time to return to the surface. Got it. Finally, Bill is getting the kind of evidence that he needs. It looks as though uh, that uh, a projectile of some sort penetrated into the uh, ammunition spaces and caused, again, a rather slow propagation of propellant uh, down the ammunition passages from aft to forward, uh, finally detonating the forward magazines. From the exploded turret roofs, Bill can read that the flash ran through the ammunition passageway from back to front. This should never have happened. Elaborate systems of hatches and one-way shutters were in place in all the dreadnoughts, specifically to prevent the transfer of flash flames from one part of the ship to the next. The regulations were very clear about the importance of observing flash protection. Was it individual negligence, or is a consistent pattern of dangerous cordite handling beginning to emerge. As the fleets met, the German vanguard had its T crossed and was taking horrendous incoming fire. But there was still to be yet another mysterious internal explosion. This time, to the Invincible, now at the front of the British line. As she led the whole of the Grand Fleet forward, her and the, the other two battle cruisers had a, a reasonable view of the German battlecruisers before them. And at short range, they pounded them. They really badly damaged the Lutzau, the Seydlitz. And the Germans could barely reply. Then suddenly, the mists before the Germans cleared. What happened was almost inevitable. One of their shells seems to have penetrated yet again one of the turrets of the Invincible. There was an enormous flash. There are amazing photographs of the flash and the huge explosion that followed. She sank, and as she sank, her back broke, and the two, the two, the bow and the stern stuck out of the water in the most macabre sight. Look again at the photograph. What a weird sight. Within those two parts of the ship, there were men struggling for their lives. Men for whom the floor had become the ceiling, the ceiling had become the floor. They didn't know where they were. Imagine what it was like below decks. Those men were doomed. Nothing could be done for them, nothing whatsoever. The loss of the Invincible continued the grim pattern of the day. 1,022 dead. Six survivors. And Shear's big guns were still unscathed. But Jellicoe's trap was closing on the German fleet. The Royal Navy may have just lost the Invincible, but the whole German fleet was now in a terrible position steaming straight into a wall of British dreadnoughts some eight miles long. Victory was now totally in Jellicoe's grasp. The visibility now favoured the British. They were, in a sense, concealed against a backdrop of dark grey gathering clouds. The British ships now could not be seen easily. All the Germans could make out was this line of gun flashes, six miles of battle fleet, plus the battle cruisers, which had now carved across the front of the fleet and were leading, so probably for eight mile arc. And the German leading ships were getting in an awful, awful position from which they had to extract themselves. And that's what Shea did. Shear performed a brilliant and unexpected manoeuvre. 
With one simple signal, his dreadnoughts, without losing speed, did a handbrake turn. It's called in uh, German Gefechtskehrtwendung. That is a turn around uh, of 180 degrees all together. It's starting with the last chip of the line and then going forward to uh, the van of your fleet. Grand Fleet battle orders had no solution to the Germans steaming off the bottom of the page. They were meant to steam along in a parallel course and obligingly be sunk. They didn't do that. Why on earth should they? The Germans disappeared back to the southwest, into the overcast, Angelico wondering what had happened. The German ships were taking a pounding, but they were resilient. On the way to Invincible, the dive team passes the site of the Lutzow, a German battle cruiser. Unlike the British ships, despite being shelled beyond recognition, she did not blow up, and only went to the bottom later when scuttled by her own crew. I understand she was hit 24 times. When you consider that the Queen Mary, the Indefatigable, and the Invincible were hit no more than three or four, maybe five times, the Lutzow withstood a huge amount of damage. So why were the British battle cruisers so vulnerable? Why does it seem the British got their design so wrong? Bill explains. Here we have a situation where I've drawn this graph that takes the nominal ship, divided into three compartments that are the same, protection, armament, speed, right? And comparing Lutzow, Queen Mary, and Invincible in the same way. And here you can see that Lutzow has a great deal of protection and only a small amount of speed. And here Invincible has only a small amount of protection and a great deal of speed. In a slugging match, Lutzow is going to win almost every time, provided you hit, because she has much more protection. She can take the shots and Invincible can't. Indefatigable, Queen Mary, Defense, and Invincible simply hadn't the armor for the roles they were given that day at Jutland. And now, with time running out, the dive team gets their first taste of North Sea weather. This is a weather forecast. Gale warning. This night, west, southwest, and There's no alternative. The team has to run to harbor. With night closing in and a gale forecast, the evidence of the HMS Invincible will have to wait. Night was also falling for Admiral Jellicoe. But at 1900 hours, having lost his main chance to destroy the German fleet, he was suddenly presented with a second golden opportunity. But how he responded to that possibility would create one of the greatest controversies in naval history. In the Battle of Jutland, Admiral Scheer had just led the Germans in a miraculous escape from the massed guns of the British Grand Fleet. But now, for some unknown reason, he made a second U-turn, heading again for the British guns. Scheer turned round again and steamed straight back into the same trouble he just escaped from. It's possible that he had seen from the southernmost gun flashes. He had judged that the British fleet was further south than it was. He may not even yet have absorbed the fact that the whole British fleet was actually present, calculating he would steam across the stern of the British fleet, whatever ships were present. But he turned right back and steamed his ships, led by his battered battle cruisers straight back into the arms of the Grand Fleet, in absolute Wurstkessel, as one German officer put it. Absolutely in the sausage pan. Once again, Jellico crossed his T. Once again, the whole of the Grand Fleet opened up. What to do? Scheer was a man who thought on his feet. He really was a, a good admiral in that sense. He may have run himself into trouble, but he was the man to get himself out of it. What did he do? He ordered forward his battle cruisers in the most amazing action. He ordered them to charge, basically, to ram, to attack, to destruction. In what became known as the death ride of the battle cruisers, Scheer threw absolutely everything at Jellicoe's wall of dreadnoughts. 
Battle cruisers are. That means uh, in German, run an den Feind. Go against the enemy and in extremely ramming the enemy. And that was like a suicidal order for the battle cruisers. But Jellico was now within range of Scheer's torpedoes. Scheer ordered a mass torpedo attack. It was an all or nothing decision, but it worked. John Jellico was faced with what he had always feared. As the torpedoes were launched and came towards the British line, he had three choices. He could turn towards and allow the torpedoes to comb the tracks. He basically, but that would double the relative speed. He could carry on as he was going and, allow, and just evade them as they came through the line, but that exposed the full length of his ships. Or he could turn away, which made a smaller target, and of course, effectively halved the speed of the torpedoes and ran them out of range. And that's what he did. Jellicoe chose the safest option. He wasn't about to risk his fleet. His priority was the long-term domination of the North Sea. It was a controversial decision. I think that was a lost opportunity. If he had turned towards the Germans, he would not have lost, he would not have lost them. And actually a, 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 a melee, if one could describe it at that, because of our superiority in numbers, uh, we could afford to lose ships. And I believe we could have destroyed the German fleet. In his defense, Jellicoe believed he had them boxed in. He could finish them off in the morning. The Admiralty had intercepted messages detailing Shear's precise route home, but they failed to relay the data to the fleet. And during the night, the Germans slipped Jellicoe's trap. The clash of the dreadnoughts was at an end. The storm is over, but the question remains. How did the Royal Navy lose some of their finest ships? Returning to the Invincible may uncover why they succumbed so easily to the German guns. Bill's seen all the documentary photographs. The evidence points strongly to cordite mishandling, but he wants to know more. The dive plan for the Invincible goes like this. Bill wants to establish the nature of the explosion by mapping the wreck. A cordite burn, as seen on the previous wrecks, would result in less damage to the hull and a smaller spread of debris. A direct hit in the magazine, however, would be far more violent, throwing the bow and stern sections much further apart. We have a few things that, that, that are really quite important to look at, uh, if we can, while we're on the wreck. Uh, the one thing I would like to establish that we can is the exact nature of the breakpoints in the hull. And by knowing the depth of the water, which we think is about 50 meters, we can then establish about where we think the breaks are, provided it's sitting down in the bottom. Now that also matches the rough calculations I did showing the radius of the explosion damage. So if we could establish that, that would be very handy. The second mission for the divers is to locate the two central gun turrets. These were called P turret and Q turret. It's said that they are now located a mile away, having blown off like champagne corks. But this would support a single direct hit detonation scenario, rather than the slow burn cordite explosion theory. Five, the team clearly has to find these turrets in order to establish which kind of explosion it was. Time to map the wreck with a side scan sonar. OK, roger that. We've just got the target in view now. Invincible appears as a huge shape on the left of the screen. She seems to be in two large parts with smaller debris scattered round. But where are the turrets? There she is. That's the turret. Whoa. That could well be it. Uh, the next exercise is going to be picking a mooring over. Innes finds what he thinks is one of the central turrets lying quite close to the wreck. Now it's time to drop the ROV and see whether he's right. Wow. That's quite big, you know. I've got a feeling that could be it. Can we just move in a bit closer? Yeah, moving in all the time. Hey, got it. Look, straight there, straight yeah. on it. Funks me noon. <laughs> Innes has found Q turret, upside down and heavily damaged. 
Both barrels are present, but the armor-plated sides are missing, proof of a massive explosion. These bent sections weigh several hundred tons. The ROV clarifies the data from the side scan. Q turret isn't a mile away, but is lying just behind the stern of the ship. Now all they have to do is locate P turret. Could it be in the same area? They start the familiar process, methodically searching the debris field inch by inch. Just come across some, uh, some wreckage here. Doesn't look much like a turret though, does it? That's, that's, that looks like shell plating. Just taking a pure gas, it looks like bottom to me. Something similar to that. Yeah, don't kill. Yeah. Okay, if you can just um, keep on taking up my umbilical. Yeah, roger that. And uh, just make my way back towards the vessel along the wreck. Okay. Reaching the end of the cable, they turn the ROV around and come back towards the wreck. That's when they run into Q turret again. Or do they? You know something, guys? That's not the turret we found earlier. It isn't, look. If you look, look at the angles there around the back, that's armor plating. You know, and that's a different turret, you know? It's got to be a different one. Can you just come up a little bit there, Chris? Yeah, sure. I just want to have a look at see whether it's got those um those, those holes in it that the other one did. <laughs> That's a different That's... turret. That's a different turret. C keep going around to the right there. Okay, moving around. That's two of them then. Yeah. Look, it's got one gun. It's got one gun. That is a different turret. We there found we the go. other one. We've done it. Look, it's about about 35 meters from the other turret in a line. That's incredible. No missing pieces. What a day. The discovery of the second turret completes the picture. The midship gun turrets are both lying upside down, somewhere behind the stern. It seems they fell backwards from their mountings as the ship broke into two, but they were not thrown a great distance from the wreck by a huge explosion. The wreck is the last resting place of 1,019 men. Only six survived the demise of the Invincible. The divers must follow the ROV umbilical line to locate the missing turrets. Yeah, see there we go. Yep. We got them. Here they come. We got them. Their first task is to send up marker boys to fix their precise position relative to the main wreck. Let me write out some While Bill starts on his calculations, the next team of divers prepare to dive on the main stern section of the wreck. They are still looking for clues. Is that a case? That's part of a Clarkson case, yeah. Yeah. The ocean floor is strewn with blasted cordite cases, and Invincible's huge guns still point defiantly towards the enemy. She was one of the fastest firing ships in the whole fleet. She should not have been so vulnerable. The divers locate X turret mounted on the stern section. The roof is missing, but the two 12-inch guns remain intact. The breach on each barrel is closed. The brass is still glinting. In the working chamber below the turret, they find an oversupply of cordite cases, explosives that should have been in the safety of the magazine. For the 
the first time, the Invincible has been thoroughly scanned and mapped. Drawing together all the new evidence may shed new light on the mystery. What we seem to have now on the bottom is the bow of Invincible here, and it's inverted. It's upside down. We have a stern section over here of Invincible, roughly like this, uh, with a large debris field in the middle, and two turrets back here, about 75 meters aft. And what it appears that has happened is the ship exploded in the middle. Uh, the turrets fell out almost immediately. The residual portion of the ship coasted on a small distance and broke in half completely. The fact is, is the, the break in the center here is not very large. Uh, it, it's not very extensive fore and aft, less than I would have expected, and that tends to indicate a sort of a slow burn as well, rather than, a, than a, a, a detonation explosion. It was really more of a, instead of a bang, it was kind of more of a woof. <laughs> okay. HMS Invincible had taken a hit amidships. The shell had penetrated the armor plating of Q turret, causing an initial explosion. Cordite stacked in her open handling passageways below passed the flash fire down a daisy chain of explosions to the inner sanctum of the ship. The final huge explosion in the magazine broke her in two, and as the sinking portions of the ship drifted forwards, the mid-gun turrets toppled out and dropped to the bottom. There's no doubt about it. This is definitely a propellant burn. There's no way around it. A uh, projectile hit somewhere around the turret uh, and started a fire in the gun house. It propagated down through the gun house, down through the hoists, uh, into the handing room, and through into the magazines. The wreck and debris of Invincible is so complete that Bill has been able to confirm his earlier suspicion. The final critical factor in her demise and the demise of others was cordite handling. It seems to have propagated relatively slowly, kind of daisy chain fashion in some sort of arrangement. That would indicate, again, uh, inadequacies in propellant handling or storage, and sometimes just pure, pure bad luck. They had laid a gunpowder trail from turret to magazine that would destroy the ship in seconds. But why? The Invincible was famed as one of the fastest firing ships in the fleet. This grew from a Royal Navy culture where swamping the enemy with shell after shell was preferred over slow, accurate fire. If you shoot quickly, you're effectively intimidating the Germans from aiming properly at you, and you're basically protecting your ships in the process. I actually know um, two old gentlemen who are now dead who served in ships in the... Uh, Grand Fleet during Jutland. And they were boys seamen, and they said that in the handling room, the charges were being brought up, and they were taken out of the cases, and they were stacked around the handling room. Now, this shouldn't happen. For safety's sake, cordite was normally stored in tubular containers until it was needed. In the heat of battle, these were, quite frankly, a nuisance. It's quite a tight fit. Your cartridge comes out there, and then you have to place them somewhere ready for them to be moved to the, uh, to the other part of the ship. Well, that's all very well with a 6-inch one, but with a 15-inch car cartridge like this, which you've got four, it's a whole different ball game. They, they just discovered they could not get the ammunition out of the boxes fast enough to get it into the ammunition hoist in order to be shot as quickly as they wanted to do. So increasingly what they do is they remove a quantity of the cordite from the boxes before shooting begins and stockpile it inside the magazine, just inside the door. As the charges come up, they were taken in and stacked ready for the next broadside. The emphasis is don't starve the guns. The guns must be kept firing all time. Keep them going. But the unpacking and stacking of cordite wasn't the only shortcut being taken. With ten guns firing every 30 seconds, and each gun requiring four cordite charges per round, there was incredible pressure on the boy seamen supplying the guns. Number one gun is ready and loaded. Make ready. Number one ready. The process of getting the cordite from the magazine below up to the turret above was slow and difficult, made harder by the safety devices in place along the supply chain. To prevent flash fire travelling down to the magazines, there were shutter devices between the handling rooms and covers on the hoists, and a series of steel doors would isolate each step in the chain. At least those were the regulations. 
They also had this cult, this British cult, of trying to do everything as fast as possible. And to that end, they cut every corner possible. So where there were safety doors that were meant to be kept locked or shut, they'd open them so they could get things through it quicker. Where they were supposed to only have the shell they were dealing with, they'd bring up extra shells, they'd bring up extra cordite, they'd bring up extra, you know, and they stacked it round so it would be more convenient. But it was also there for when the flash came. And when the shells got into the turrets, then flash was the enemy of the ship. It wasn't just the enemy, it was, it was, it was the end of the ship. The gun crews of Invincible had been building a bomb and they had handed the enemy the fuse. So had the crews of Queen Mary, Defence, and the rest of the Grand Fleet. The divers' new evidence from the wrecks confirms it. Failures in tactics, armor, and communication had all played a part. But the final reason they'd blown up so spectacularly, and with such catastrophic loss of life, was the careless handling of their own explosives. The Battle of Jutland had lasted 12 hours. The Royal Navy had lost 14 ships and 6,094 men. But the British Navy weren't the only ones to have suffered. The German high seas fleet had received a severe mauling. Her losses were great, her casualties many. 11 ships and 2,551 men. They returned bit by shattered bit to their safe harbors ahead of the British, whose losses, for all they looked like own goals, were enough for the Kaiser to try and claim a victory. In the absence of better information initially, the British press couldn't argue. In fact, of course, in terms of pure numbers of ships sunk and men killed, yes, it appears to be a German victory, but that's not what fleets are for. Fleets are there for functional purposes. And the Britain's functional purpose was to preserve command of the sea. And the day after Jutland, we had command of the sea in as full measure, if not more, than we had had it before. The Germans had come out, they'd met our fleet, they got a hell of a shock. And in a funny way, the ships we lost blew up and sank and everyone was killed. The German ships got back with masses of people injured, and there was no way those Germans wanted to come out and fight the British again. Scheer was of the opinion it was impossible for the German side to get a decisive victory against the British uh, Grand Fleet. And he said to the Kaiser, we must introduce more and more submarine warfare. It is too risky for us uh, to go into fleet action in the North Sea. Britain's supremacy of the North Sea remains in place because the Germans never effectively tried to challenge it again after Jutland. A compelling result. The blockade stood firm. And yet British ships were lost, let alone over 6,000 British lives. And the war wasn't over. Beatty was right. There was something wrong with our bloody ships, and now we know what. But why wasn't the nation told at the time? The battle moved from the North Sea to the corridors of Whitehall. The battle cruiser people, and even the Grand Fleet, um, it rapidly becomes apparent to them that if they attribute the loss of the ships to ammunition handling practices, they're effectively saying that they were responsible for themselves for losing their own ships. So increasingly, they start saying, well, no, the problem isn't with our procedures, it's with the ships. Anything to deflect accusations that the officers and the battle cruisers have been responsible for the loss of the ships themselves. But to a great extent, they were, and the Admiralty knew it. An internal report was prepared that would have said exactly what was wrong on board those ships. But then a strange thing happened. Only months after Jutland, Jellicoe took over the Admiralty as first Sea Lord, and Beatty became commander of the fleet. When Jellicoe puts his feet under the desk of the first Sea Lord, one of the first reports to come in front of him was this report saying, it's complete nonsense, there's anything wrong with our ships. The real problem was with the lax cordite handling. Uh, Chelico takes one look at this report and he writes in one line, I do not agree with this. No one in the fleet agrees with this. The matter is closed. Signed, John Jellicoe. 
And of course, as David Beatty was now commander-in-chief, there was no complaint from the fleet. And so the report was buried. To celebrate the battle, fountains were added to Trafalgar Square, not as had been hoped a second column. And to honor the commanders, a plaque was laid, a plaque that lies with unintended irony in the shadow of Lord Nelson. It isn't the great smashing victory that everybody expects. There is criticism of Jellicoe, however uh, ill-deserved. Jellicoe himself will be quietly sidelined. His reputation will be tarnished, and therefore he is not to become the second Nelson, as perhaps people might have thought he might become. The rotting hulks of the mighty dreadnoughts bear silent witness to that fateful day. Many factors had contributed to the loss of their ships, but the devotion to rapid fire and the resultant suicidal handling of cordite had been the final critical flaw. In the days following the battle, the bodies of many of the seamen from both sides washed ashore on the Danish coast. Many are still buried on the hillsides overlooking the waters of the Battle of Jutland.